So what is black sociology? In some ways, perhaps it is an ambiguous term, has, has a variety of meanings. Does it mean that it's um, determined by the racial identity, for example, of a researcher? Does it mean it's socially, sociological inquiry by people whose racial identity is socially defined and labelled black? And how does that racial identity therefore influence social inquiry? Is it race relations research by black sociologists, therefore, for example, a black scholar who may be working with um, non-black scholars? Um, is it theory and issues investigated by sociologists uh, that are of interest, for example, to black people? Um, and there I'm thinking of things like colonisation and institutional racism. Is it a commitment of sociologists to freedom of black people from race-related um, oppressions? Therefore, perhaps the race of the sociologist um, is less important. For example, there are white sociologists, Marxists, liberals, who do share the black concern of unravelling structures of oppression. I guess, however, in, in saying that no white sociologists, no matter how left they are, um, and none of them will have had the actual experience of being black, the physical and mental abuse uh, based on membership of a particular racial group, um, and, and nor therefore the social and psychological degradation that can occur through direct and indirect experience of racial discrimination. So the Association of Black Sociologists was founded in 1970. There is actually a group of people who are called black sociologists. And the aim was of building that association was to build a, connect, a connection or build a network of scholars who serve the interests of historically disenfranchised groups um, in general. So their interest is broader than um, black people, but for black and African-American people in particular, so those scholars could be sociologists, social scientists, could be community activists, for example, and includes um, students as well. So the aim is to foster inclusion and therefore to counter the exclusion that many black people have experienced. And they want to generate, they're quite specific about this, they want to generate uh, knowledge that is socially transformative. And this is from, this statement is from um, the first president of the Association of Black Sociologists, who was James Blackwell. He was born in 1925. When he enrolled at Washington uh, State University in 1955, there were only 15 black students on campus. And in 1970, at the University of Massachusetts, um, they hired Blackwell to build they had just a very small department of sociology and anthropology, so they asked him to build that up. Um, and that was at their campus that had only been there for about five years. And he planned uh, to stay for only five or six years, but ended up remaining for 20. And under his chairmanship, uh, the faculty in his department tripled from 11 to 34 members. At a meeting shortly after his arrival, he found that he was the only minority in the room. Therefore, he made it a point to stick his head into every office looking for people of colour. At the time, minorities filled only 3.5 faculty positions. He challenged the university president then to improve the situation. And an affirmative action office was established on campus in 1970. Um, in 1971, which was actually the very first one in the American university um, system. And he thought, what he says is that he thought it was important to sensitise the officials um, at the university to the need for a multicultural student body and faculty, particularly in an urban area like Boston, um, he says, which makes complete sense to me. If you've been to Boston, you'll know about the diversity there. Um, by the time he had retired, something like 18.77% of the faculty and more than 25% of the students were minorities. And women comprised then um, more than 40% of the employees. As a teacher, Blackwell's goal has been to help students to gain an appreciation of knowledge, but not just for the sake of knowledge alone. He actually wanted them to put what they learn to use by going on to graduate and professional schools and making contributions um, as citizens uh, to their community.
So in this quote, um, of which I'll read for those who are not watching the video, uh, it has always been my belief, he says, that sociologists should not be completely sanguine with the production of larger cores of knowledge. Rather, sociologists should take aggressive leadership in demonstrating how that knowledge can more effectively be utilised for the greater social good. So he has an intent behind his knowledge. He doesn't want to just make people feel good by knowing more and impressing other people with all their knowledge, but actually take that knowledge out into the world and do some social good. So remember, it was uh, Max Weber who introduced the idea, uh, the idea of ideal types. No one actually fits these, but the term has its uses. So I'm taking these ideal types of a black sociologist from the work of William Watson, um, who was writing this back in 1976. So the type one ideal type, black sociologist, is or black sociology is social inquiry that's conducted by a person whose social identity is black and their ideological allegiance is to the freedom. So they have a mindset already that they're, that they're coming from the point of view or the standpoint that they want freedom for black people from race-related depression. And their primary research population is black people. So they're black, the research population is black, and they have an intention of generating knowledge that is for the freedom of black people. The second ideal type of black sociology is a black sociology, a black sociologist who focuses attention on a white research population. Um, and so therefore the interests are in the similarities and differences between black and white culture, wanting to understand the structure of um, oppression, to understand social and psychological factors that contribute to intergroup conflict. For example, studies of national and multinational corporations that source raw materials, cheap labour from black people to make a profit. And of course, this type of black um, sociology is therefore also interested in colonisation and the ongoing and intergenerational effects, um, of, of effects which are going to be both um, a benefit to some people and um, a detriment to other groups of people. So that's the second type of black sociology. The third type of black sociology is inquiries that are actually conducted by mainstream white sociologists. So this is all according to William Watson. So these white sociologists are seeking to understand the social behaviour, the culture of black people. There is a concern that these mainstream sociologists saw little in the culture of black people worth preserving. Um, kind of expected them to become part of a melting pot, which is very much a 1970s thinking, the idea of the melting pot. Um, compared to the ideal um, of black sociology, um, particularly that first one, I said, really it's the, it's the, the um, ideal type number one of black sociologists, these sociologists are a little bit um, marginal. Type four, black sociologists are white sociologists studying white people's behaviour without any emphasis on social change. So we'd be having a look to see, for example, how white people respond um, in, in regard to social relationships with other groups of people, including black people. Um, but it's more a sense of curiosity, I suppose, without that political edge of wanting to do something about creating some change, in, particularly in favour um, of black people. There's the idea that William Watson calls on uh, called a cultural data bank. What can go into a cultural data bank that's used for studying black culture? Um, there's all the social theories, for example, of black sociologists around um, ideas around colonisation and decolonisation, ideas of institutional. Um, so if I just back up there, I'm sure that you probably already do know that colonisation is the taking over, the settling and can taking control of an area of land um, or a domain for use of non-Indigenous people or for, or for one's own use. So it's possible for me to go in and colonise somebody's office, for example. So that's that idea of going in and taking over. 
Um, then also a part of this cultural data bank is the idea of institutional racism. And by that, I mean a pattern of social and political institutions which treat some groups less favorably than others. And for example, um, there's the historic barring of um, prohibition against African-American students from attending certain schools. Um, that's one example. Another would be judges giving different sentences for exactly the same crime to different groups of people. Um, if when I'm thinking about institutional racism, I'm thinking also about things like the, um, you know, the, the reality that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people in Australia are about 17 times more likely to be involved in the justice system than their peers, um, and, and by that I'm thinking about incarceration. So despite making up just 3% of the general population, about one quarter of our um, prison population is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Now that really can't be explained by anything like criminality that's associated with a particular background and it can't really be explained away by just socioeconomic location. It is indicative of some sort of institutional racism or discrimination. Also in our cultural data bank, the sexual and economic exploitation. So, and by economic exploitation, I'm thinking there of where black, water, uh, black workers don't receive or haven't historically received their proper entitlement. And slavery, of course, was all about economic exploitation. Sexual exploitation, that's the sexual abuse and use of black people, children and adults. African-Americans raped, sold into brothels, for example, and used for sex. Um, race roles as well, as, as well, we think about that as a role that we play, it's a, um, race as a, as a role, uh, like gender, um, it's a role that we play, it's a way of behaving, a performance that we give, um, some people might even think of it as a garment that we just put on and take off, a bit like gender roles. Um, and I'm just trying to think of some examples where I can see that. One, one thing I guess comes to mind is those old images of very deferential um, uh, roles played by black servants, for example. So it would be yes master, no master, etc. But then they would take that, that, that garment off literally and behave quite differently in, in other groups more assertively, but they needed to play the role of the deferential servant when being around white people. There's plenty of examples of that that I can kind of see in my mind from watching films, but also have um, heard about those stories as well. Um, and then there's the idea of pan-Africanism, which is the principle um, that the indigenous inhabitants of Africa from across the world actually join together in solidarity because of their past, which are all interconnected. So that's kind of the social theories that you'd be thinking about, but how you might also, but also in this cultural data bank and how you might go about doing some research is looking at things like slave narratives. Um, and I guess there's an, the emphasis there on, on slavery because this is an African-American initiative, even though they will be inclusive of black people from across the globe. So slave narratives, protest pamphlets, poetry, plays, music, art, novels, speeches, um, and Sojourner Truth comes to mind for me as having made some really important speeches back in the 19th century about abolition, but also about feminism. There's her Aunt I a uh, Woman to speech, which is very well known. And of course, also in that cultural data bank are black people themselves. So you might do research that surveys or um, has more intimate contact, like doing um, interviews with people who are, who are identified as black. So black sociology is actually in many ways intellectually deviant because it raises questions. It raises questions about inequalities of economic, social and political privilege. It raises questions about social conflict, what goes on there, who initiates it, how it happens, how it's perpetrated, in, in whose benefit is it performed for. It raises questions about the racial and ethnic identities of who does sociology, and of course it's all about differences 
in perspectives as well. And it also signals, um, I think, discontent with the white establishment. So you've got a group of sociologists who've come together and said something's missing here. Why don't we join forces and um, present some challenges? And it points to the recognition of the importance of collective action for social change. So rather than individual black sociologists working together, they have actually joined together as an association so they can have a little bit more clout in the world. And I want to talk to you today about an ideal type, um, black sociologist, and this, this is the number one ideal type. So talking about it, you, you'll find a little bit more in the readings about his background, so I'm not going to talk a lot about that today. But W.E.B. Du Bois, I think is the way his name is pronounced, was a pioneer in the studies of social structure and social organisation of race relationships. And as a black sociologist, he con concentrated primarily on the social behaviour of black people with a focus on um, a really critical analysis of the systems of social oppression. And his primary interest was in the intellectual, political and economic liberation of black people. So he's very much that number one ideal type of black sociologist. Uh, he was an American sociologist, an historian, a civil rights activist and a writer. Uh, born in the north of America in Massachusetts, so the north of America was slightly more favourable. Um, I say that raising some questions um, um, compared to, for example, the south of America. He went on after he got his degrees, and he had a number of them, including from Harvard University. So that by the time he had finished his uh, PhD, um, which I think was from Harvard, he was one of the most educated people in the world at a time when black people were seen as intellectually inferior to white people. And I think that's something that is really important to know, because it would have been very few people at that time who had a PhD on the one hand, and on the other hand, so he did have that, so he was very highly educated. And on the other hand, black people uh, were being told that they were intellectually inferior. And of course, that was a discussion amongst white people as well. He went on to become a professor of history and sociology and economics, I think, at Atlanta University, which is in this, which of course is in the um, southern state of Georgia. Um, and really well known for its racial segregation, so quite different from growing up in Massachusetts. And he founded uh, what was called the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People, which was an OK term back in 1909. And he argued very strongly against lynching, Jim Crow laws and discrimination in education and employment. And in case you don't know about lynching, it's the practice of murder outside of sanctioned murder, that is, by state authorised executions. And this is a picture of a man called George Meadows, who was lynched near the Pratt Mines in Jefferson County in Alabama in 1889. Um, and that was 24 years after the end of the Civil War in America, which went from 1861, I think, to 1865, and which broke out, of course, over the whole issue of slavery. Jim Crow laws, if you don't know, were about state and local laws that enforced racial segregation, particularly in the southern states of the United um, of the United States. And so these laws continued to be enforced right through until 1965, and they mandated ra racial segregation in all public facilities. So that was in bathrooms and washrooms, on public transport, and in restaurants, etc. Du Bois also challenged what he saw as car window and armchair sociology. So for him, an armchair sociologist is someone who doesn't gather any new information, but rather does an analysis of existing material. And car window sociology is passing through an area quickly, making observations from a distance rather than getting up close and personal with the people. Um, and by people, he was thinking of African Americans. And by getting up and close and personal, he was seeking to understand them and why they um, lived and behaved as they did. So Du Bois argued that social scientists and sociologists 
were actually more focused on theories and laws and principles than actually going out and empirically studying contemporary social issues. And so he argued for far more evidence and far less theory, which he wasn't finding particularly helpful. And so he practiced what he preached. He went out and did an ethnographic study, which was published in uh, 1899, and it was called the Philadelphia Negro. So ethnography is a systematic study of a people, and if you're doing any anthropology, you'll be familiar with that. And the observation is done from the perspective of the person who lives in the group of people being studied, rather than from the outsider perspective, even though, is that even possible? Anyway, a different topic for for a different day. So what Du Bois did was spend 16 months um, from 1886 to 1887 undertaking this study whereby he and his wife actually moved into a particular area of, of Philadelphia called the Seventh Ward and I guess it was kind of a ghetto area at the time. Uh, lots of poor black people living there. And it's after um, it's, it's after the end of the war in a period of, what, of what's called Reconstruction and many uh, black people were migrating from the southern states where they were released from slavery but they weren't necessarily getting any work or decent work and they were moving up to the northern states. Um, so this was an area of Philadelphia, as I said, called the Seventh Ward, and he and his wife lived there. And what he did was hand out questionnaires, which covered a range of um, areas. He wanted to know about people's occupation. He wanted to know about health, their education levels, um, their religion, um, any sort of attachment to religions, what they did in their family life, and any other sort of demographic information. And he went from door to door and he did over 5,000 um, personal interviews with people, which is an extraordinary number, <laughs> absolutely extraordinary. And he did that with just one um, research assistant. And the findings um, reveal diversity in this community. So where people would generalize, for example, about black people, what he found that there were some people who were doing well financially, and there were people living in dire, pol um, dire, pol sorry, dire poverty, had trouble with that. Um, there were people doing crime, uh, there were people also unable to read and write. So there was a diversity in this group. To explain the diversity, he said that the Negro community had their own internal class structure. And he emphasised um, the socio-economic and historical causes of the so-called Negro problem. Uh, the the post-slavery discrimination against blacks, um, so they were discriminated against, so they didn't get the best jobs, for example, and that was part of the legacy of slavery and unequal race relations. For example, he found that African Americans had to pay the highest rent um, for the worst accommodation in Philadelphia. What made his work distinctive and important was that he utterly rejected inherent racial differences. So he was well and truly ahead of his time here. He is thinking about social construction is the way that we would talk about it now. For him, the problems that black people faced all had to do with the way that they were treated in the past and the way that they were being treated in the present. Double consciousness was an idea that Du Bois developed in his book, The Souls of Black Folk, which I have put on the reading list and which I recommend uh, that you read. It was first published in 1903 and really rather than a single book, it's a series of essays about race um, and it's an autoethnographic study. So it includes his own views of that as well. So auto meaning self and ethnographic study of a group of people. So he's connecting his own experiences back to the larger uh, social situation. Um, and so he is basing the book. I find it really wonderful the way in which he's written it because he also looks at some of the, the spirituals, the songs that um, slaves used to sing uh, in the fields and he incorporates that into his book at all as well. So if you get a chance to read it, then I'll, I highly recommend it. He says about double consciousness, 
that the Negro, and in this time the Negro was an, uh, an okay word to use, so the Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see him, himself through the revelation of the other world. It's a peculiar sensation, Du Bois go, goes on, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. So double consciousness, as I understand it, is the idea that black people see themselves as others see them, that is the dominant white society, and they see themselves as they experience themselves. So, for example, a black man might see himself as intellectually inferior because that was the prevailing idea at the time when Chip Boyce was writing. And he might also see himself as smart because he has his own lived experience of being able to survive using his wits. Du Bois goes on to say that the dilemma for African Americans is to be both a Negro and an American without being cursed and spit upon by his fellows, without having the doors of opportunity closed roughly in his face. This striving, he said, is not a weakness, it is the contradiction of double aims. And the example he uses is the double aim of trying to escape the contempt of white people for being a farmer with the need to be a farmer in order to feed his family. So Du Bois says this means that the African-American man doesn't really have his heart in either cause. And I'm aware that he's using androcentric language, uh, a feature of his time, I guess, and we'll go on to talk about black feminism as well. So he's very much an ideal type um, of doing and being a black sociologist. Um, it was social inquiry conducted by a person whose social identity is black. His ideological allegiance was definitely to the freedom of black people from race related oppression and his primary research population is black people. So here's another one of these ideal types and that's Patricia Hill Collins who is Distinguished Professor of Sociology at the University of Maryland. She went to school in Philadelphia, which is a nice connection back with Du Bois, and noticed from a very early age that she was treated differently because the majority of students were from the white middle class. She was elected president of the American Sociological Association in 2009, and she was the first African-American woman elected to that position. She was the 100th president of the association, so it actually took the association quite a long time to get there. Patricia Hill Collins is best known for her intersectional research and theory. That is, she's interested in the intersection of race and gender and class and sexuality. And by intersectionality, I mean the idea that oppressions intersect and compound. For example, I came from a very poor uh, background at a time when women weren't expected or encouraged to go to university. So sexism and classism affected me. But if I'd been an Aboriginal woman, I would have had to contend with racism, sexism and classism. Many African Americans don't realise, says Collins, that they are privileged by their gender if not by their race. And if they are straight, they are privileged because of heterosexism too. So that's what she's interested in, all of those um, intersections and how some, some people have more barriers than other people do. Um, this is what she says, and again, I'm reading the quotation for those who are listening and not watching. Beginning in adolescence, I was increasingly the first one of the very few or the only African American woman and or woman and or working class person in my schools, communities and work settings. So you can see her intersections of being a woman, of being black and of being working class. I saw nothing wrong with being who I was, but apparently many others did. 
My world grew larger, but I felt I was growing smaller. I tried to disappear into myself in order to deflect the painful daily assaults designed to teach me that being an African-American working class woman made me lesser than those who were not. And as I felt smaller, I became quieter and eventually was virtually silenced. But not for long. One concept that she employs is that of being an outsider within. And she uses the example of Judith um, Rollins, who as part of her field work on black domestics, worked as one for six months. And Judith Rollins write, writes about the times when her employers treated her as if she was not really there, like having a conversation between themselves with no acknowledgement that she's present in a room, which always reminds me of those very formal dinner parties that you'll see on, on movies about a particular um, time in history where very formal, lots of servants, everybody's having a conversation. The servants can hear that conversation, but it's almost as if they're not even in the room. They're totally disregarded. So that's the sort of thing that she's talking about. So while she was working as a domestic, Judith Rollins, um, and noticing this, that she was, you know, just ignored, totally ignored, she took out a piece of paper and began writing field notes. And she wrote for 10 minutes, she finished her lunch and she returned to work. And she noticed also that her employers didn't even seem to notice that she'd gone for that time and, and been doing that work on her own. So this idea of what black domestic servants um, witness is actually conveyed in the 2011 film based on the 2009 book by a woman called Catherine Stockett. However, from an African-American perspective, the film has been criticised for distorting and trivialising the experiences of black domestic workers. But you could perhaps um, have a look at that just to get that idea of the way in which African-American uh, domestic servants were ignored often in the household. So African-American women have worked within white homes, but they're not really the insiders. They're the outsider within, but that allows quite a distinctive standpoint. And this standpoint has generated black feminist thought. So don't ever think that because you're feeling marginalized and um, you know, excluded or on the outside that you don't have something useful to say because you actually do have quite a distinctive standpoint. So uh, Patricia Hill Collins uses George Simmel's ideas about the sociological significance of the stranger. He said that a stranger actually has something of the objective about about them um, because they have this peculiar composition of, of both nearness and remoteness, concern and indifference. So they can take, um, so I know that we've had that discussion about not really being able to be objective because we always bring with, our, with us our values, etc. Um, but we can get perhaps a little bit of, of, uh, of distance. And I think there about the idea of the fishbowl. When you're swimming in the fishbowl, it's hard to see what's going on and you can't see all the other fish. But if you can get out of the fishbowl and look inside, then you do get a different perspective. And it's that kind of um, a distance, I guess. Uh, and Simmel also goes on to, to say that people tend to confide in strangers in ways they don't with people they know. Uh, might feel a little bit safer, the person's going to disappear and won't remember them, or it doesn't matter if they do. And strangers, importantly, and this is the outsider within, can see social patterns that are more difficult for others to see. And I think that that is um, true, because if you're in, a, in the situation um, and you're very comfortable with it, then you, you're just immersed in it. You're, you're in the fishbowl. You can't really see things that others can't can. So she wants, black, uh, Patricia Hill Collins, she wants black women to create their own standards for black womanhood and value their work. She wants black women to reject internalised psychological oppression. And remember that double consciousness of Du Bois, how black people see themselves um, as the dominant white society uh, see them. She wants different 
Uh, she says that you can't separate thought from the historical and material conditions which shape the lives of people. That's the idea of social construction. She says that black women do have this unique perspective of their uh, experience and there will be commonalities of perspective by black women as a group. However, there's also diversity and therefore difference within the black women group and that, that diversity is around class and age and sexual orientation, etc. And black feminist thought as an intellectual tradition does raise the consciousness of black women. And the whole idea about raising consciousness is that you might think that you're alone in your situation. And when your consciousness is raised, then you realize that this is not a personal problem. This is a political issue. Patricia Collins loves to tell stories and she tells one about a stage. So imagine a stage, something like this. And in the center of the stage is a young, attractive, white, privileged American male. He is every man, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but always the center of the stage. Because he is the center of the stage, it's hard to imagine him not being there. The man is rarely alone on the stage, however, because there are props. The props are there to look after him, to make sure he has a script to learn, food to eat, clothes to wear, some of the props are beautiful and exotic and the man gets a bit mesmerized by them. But the props are never treated as if they are fully human. And while they're part of the story, really the story is all about him. So Native Americans are the props for the telling of the story about the taming of the West. When the story of race in America is told, the props are African Americans. When the story is based at home, the props are white women who mother the star, marry him, raise his children. So men have women as props. She says whites have blacks as props. Rich people have poor people as props. Middle-aged people have young people as props. Christians have Muslims as props. But what happens if the props start moving, refuse to leave, decide to tell their own stories? Some props refuse to learn their lines. They break out of character, talk back, storm off, refuse to perform. What do you think the white, a white American male would say or do? What happens next? Eliminate all the props, incarcerate them, kill them. Install token props. See how we've changed. We've had a black president. Everyone makes room for everyone. And there are no stars. The other story she tells is a version of the Emperor's New Clothes, which you may remember from your childhood. It's a holiday in our mythical town and there's a big celebration like New Year's Eve. People don't have smartphones or anything because this story is set back in the day. And at first glance, the crowd seems to be an undifferentiated mass. But if you look a bit more closely, spend a little bit more time there, you will see that the closeness to the emperor is dictated by the crown's relationship to him. So his allies, of course, are very close. Some are even up there on the stage. Some in the, in the inner circle are in the crowd. Um, but they're right in front. They're right in front. They're right up close to the emperor. So she, uh, Patricia Hill Collins is saying that people see their own status as a reflection of their proximity to the emperor. Those who are close to him see, that, see themselves as more important than other people. And those who are far further away, of course, want to get up close and that's called social mobility. Many in the crowd will do anything to get close to the emperor, but others are a bit more ambivalent. All the television shows, all the textbooks, the art, the newspaper, that's all focused on the emperor. How does the emperor convince his empire that it's a good thing? Well, by clothes, he looks grand, so he must be grand. There are scholar tailors who highlight his good features and hide his bad. And there are, of course, media pundits who spread his message far and wide. What, though, if the truth teller is an American girl, an African-American girl, the person who calls the emperor out for wearing no clothes? what will happen to her? It's likely she'll be silenced, demeaned, helped, in other words, 
assimilated, so she goes on to speak standard English, perhaps sent off to counselling to help her drop her bad attitude. So that's two stories from Patricia Collins. And in summary for this week, I've talked about an ideal type of black sociology, which is social inquiry conducted by a black person into the lives of black people for the purposes of improving their lives. Two significant black sociologists are W.E.B. Du Bois, who should be regarded, I think, as one of the founders of sociology, and Patricia Hill Collins, who focuses on the intersectionality of oppressions. And thank you for listening.